The year 1996 brought us a lot of great things. In the world of film, we were first introduced to Scream. In music, Jay-Z released his debut album, Reasonable Doubt, and in the WWF, we'd see the rise of Austin 316. Yes, it was a pivotal year in the wrestling world, as it would be the period that saw the Monday Night Wars really get started. As while some key figures would leave WWF, others would begin to rise in their place. So join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWF in 1996, A Year in Review. When we last left off, Vince McMahon had finally decided to throw in the towel on the Diesel experiment, instead temporarily reverting back to Bret Hart until he could get his next big star ready to be crowned at WrestleMania. Before we would get there though, the first big show of the year, the Royal Rumble, would take place on January 26th with a card that featured the Hitman defending the WWF title against The Undertaker, all while in the undercard, the Smoking Guns would retain the tag straps against the Body Donnas and Goldust would defeat Razor Ramon to become the Intercontinental Champion. Over in the most anticipated bout of the night, meanwhile, the Rumble itself would feature a number of big names including Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Vader, and a new recruit into the company, The Ringmaster. Yes, played by WCW's stunning Steve Austin, The Ringmaster had been brought in as Ted DiBiase's new client, with the legend even going as far as to bestow upon him his old million dollar championship going forward. But that wouldn't be enough to get him the win on this night as, for the second year running, it would be Shawn Michaels who picked up the victory come the end, booking himself a spot in the main event of WrestleMania once again, this time against Bret Hart. That said, there would be complications along the way as, after having suffered a real-life beating at the hands of a group of Marines the year prior, HBK would use this to start a storyline which saw him suffer some long-term effects, something which had been highlighted the prior November when he kayfabe collapsed in the middle of the ring during a bout with Owen Hart, a moment Hart would later take credit for causing. So this would eventually lead to the two going one-on-one -on -one at February 8th's In Your House 6 Rage in the Cage, where putting his number one contendership spot on the line, HBK would be able to reign tall and continue on the path towards achieving his boyhood dream. Elsewhere, the rest of the card would see the click rule as Hunter Hearst Helmsley defeated Duke the Dumpster Drossy and Razor Ramon defeated the 1-2-3 Kid. After that though, the main event featured the rematch between the Hitman and Diesel, with things this time being held inside of a steel cage. The cage, however, would not be able to stop The Undertaker, as at the close of the bout, he'd burst out from under the ring to pull Diesel down to the depths of hell, allowing Brett to get the win. And this was done so as to set up a match between the two big men at WrestleMania the following month, with initial plans allegedly being for Big Daddy Cool to get the win here. Before that would happen though, both he and Razor Ramon would give their notice to leave the company as, frustrated with the lack of money they were making during WWF's leanest time financially, they decided that the grass would be greener over in WCW, where Eric Bischoff had promised them both huge contracts. And obviously upset about this, Vince McMahon would pull Razor from his planned match with Goldust at the Showcase of the Immortals, instead replacing him with Rowdy Roddy Piper as the two went on to have a very memorable Hollywood backlot brawl that offered more than a passing nod to the O.J. Simpson police chase of the year before and eventually saw Piper come out on top in the end. Elsewhere on the card of WrestleMania 12 though, the boss would not replace Diesel from his match with The Undertaker as this had already been promoted on TV. That said, he would change the finish, allowing the dead man to take his streak to 5-0, saving a major future storyline that no one realized was a thing yet. But that wasn't all that was happening as, elsewhere, the Body Donnas would win a tournament to crown themselves the new tag team champions after those belts had been vacated following an injury picked up by Billy Gunn. On top of this, Steve Austin, who had by then already dropped the Ringmaster gimmick and had morphed into a colder-blooded Stone Cold gimmick, would have his first great WrestleMania match when he defeated Savio Vega, all while the Ultimate Warrior would make yet another return to the company when he beat Hunter Hearst Helmsley in less than two minutes. Over in the main event, however, there would not be so quick an end as, in a 60-minute Iron Man match, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels would go the distance, battling it out to the point of exhaustion in about that, depending on who you ask, can be considered either the greatest wrestling match ever or the most overrated. 
and after an hour of neither man being able to score a fall, it would end up going down to sudden death, with HBK hitting his opponent with two super kicks at this point to finally achieve his boyhood dream and become WWF champion. But after the match, Heat would begin to build when the new champion allegedly instructed Hart to get out of his ring so that he could have his moment. And this, while only a small moment at the time, would eventually snowball into a much bigger real-life beef between the two which would go on to define the company's next couple of years. That would remain on the back burner for now though as, taking a much needed break from the ring, the hitman would disappear for the next 10 months, trying his hand out at acting all while the new champion would establish himself in his absence. And this really began at April 28th's In Your House 6, Good Friends, Better Enemies, where, in a show that featured an undercard of mostly trivial matches, the main event would see Sean and Diesel go one-on-one -on -one for the final time as they battled it out over the WWF title in a no-holds-barred match. And after putting his friend over strong here, Kevin Nash would begin to make final plans for his exit as, at a house show in Madison Square Garden, he, Razor Ramon, Hunter Hearst Helmsley, and Shawn Michaels would all break kayfabe when they embraced each other in the middle of the ring, offering the fans a look at the clique's final farewell, but also infuriating a lot of people behind the scenes in the process. So needing to enact some kind of punishment, Vince McMahon would begin working on a way to deal with the situation, but this was easier said than done, as with Hall and Nash now both gone to WCW and HBK pretty much bulletproof as the world champion, the sword instead had to fall on Helmsley as, taking the heat for the rest of his friends, he'd spend the next year in the doghouse, even having his planned King of the Ring win later that year cancelled. And things would start to get tougher for WWF as a whole then too, as with the two exiting click members jumping over to WCW and starting the NWO storyline, the Southern Wrestling promotion suddenly looked like the far cooler product and, as such, almost immediately began overtaking McMahon's promotion in the ratings. But if the boss thought his next pay-per-view, In Your House 8, Beware of Dog, on May 26th would help things, he was very wrong, as on that night, a massive power outage would cause the show to have to be stopped midway through, with the rest of the card being rescheduled for two days later instead. And it wasn't as if the card was anything to write home about anyway, as despite Shawn Michaels defending the WWF title against the British Bulldog and the Smoking Guns regaining their tag team titles, the only really noteworthy bout would be Steve Austin and Savio Vega's Caribbean Strap Match. So perhaps it was this that made McMahon realize that Austin had the potential to be more than a mid-carter, as the following month he would pick him to replace Triple H in becoming the King of the Ring. Before we would get there though, WWF would take a trip over to the Middle East to do a special live tour, with the highlights of this being Ahmed Johnson winning the Kuwait Cup and Bret Hart even returning briefly to make an appearance. Once they were back stateside however, it would be full steam ahead with the King of the Ring where, just one week after WCW had shaken the wrestling world to its core by having Hulk Hogan turn heel and join the NWO, WWF would have its own history making moment, when after defeating both Mark Merrow and Jake Roberts to win the tournament, Steve Austin would go up the entrance ramp and cut a promo on the fly that has since been remembered as arguably the most important in the industry's history. Yes, this was the famous Austin 316 promo, and immediately it would turn Stone Cold into the coolest figure in the company, all this despite the fact that he was still supposed to be a heel. Elsewhere, the rest of the card would see a recently debuted Mankind get a shock win over The Undertaker, and The Ultimate Warrior defeat Jerry Lawler in what turned out to be the last big match of the former's run before he was once again fired for no-showing events. And after that, in the main event, Shawn Michaels would successfully defend his WWF title against the British Bulldog in a match that left few excited. Yes, for as great as HBK was, the reality remained that, as a champion, he just wasn't drawing, something which admittedly wasn't helped by the fact that WCW were, by some distance, the show to watch by then. And things wouldn't fare much better for Sean at the next month's pay-per-view, In Your House 9 International Incident, as there he'd be stuck in a pretty throwaway six-man tag match that saw him team up with Psycho Sid and Ahmed Johnson to take on the British Bulldog, Owen Hart, and the new monster on the block, Vader. And so dominant was the Mastodon during this that, by the end of the bout, he'd be the one who'd get the win, booking him a shot at HBK at the following month's SummerSlam. So when that event came on August 18th then, the champion knew he was in for his biggest challenge yet. 
and as it happened, the original booking plans were supposed to see Vader win this one, all until Sean was able to use his backstage sway to get this decision changed at the last minute. Yes, by now, Michaels was gaining a reputation for being impossible to work with behind the scenes, something which was even made worse by his ever-growing drug problem. And that was how, after technically winning twice, once by disqualification and once by countout, Vader would end up losing that night as the champ's reign continued. That said, the biggest shocker of the night came before this when, in a boiler room brawl, Mankind would once again defeat The Undertaker after Paul Bearer turned on the dead man, laying him out with his own urn and aligning himself with Mick Foley's demented creation from there on in. But wait, where was the fastest rising star in the industry, Steve Austin, on this card? Well, despite what revisionist history may have you believe, Stone Cold did not rocket to the main event right after winning the King of the Ring. Sure, his popularity with fans as an anti-hero would grow and grow over these months, but in terms of his booking, well, that was far slower to catch up as, on this event, he'd be relegated to a pre-show match with Yokozuna. And he wouldn't fare much better at September 22nd's In Your House 10 Mind Games as, on that night, he wouldn't even be on the card, instead having to watch from the sidelines as Owen Hart and the British Bulldog defeated the Smoking Guns to win the tag titles, a recently debuted Mark Henry picked up a victory over Jerry Lawler, and Shawn Michaels went to a no contest with Mankind in one of the most underrated matches in WWF history, about so good that for many years thereafter, Mick Foley would consider it to be his best. Yes, it was finally the great title defense HBK needed, but as for the Intercontinental title, well, that would have a far rougher period as, after being laid out and kayfabe injured by a debuting Farouk, Ahmed Johnson would be forced to vacate the IC belt. And this led to a tournament being held to crown a new champion then, one which would climax on the September 23rd episode of Raw when Mark Merrow was able to defeat Ron Simmons' newest gimmick. After that, the next big show of the year, In Your House 11 Buried Alive, would take place on October 20th and would see Owen Hart and the British Bulldogs successfully defend their tag team titles against the Smoking Guns, Psycho Sid defeat Vader to earn a future shot at the WWF title, Shawn Michaels defeat Goldust in a dark match, and Steve Austin finally getting something to sink his teeth into when he picked up a win over Hunter Hearst Helmsley, all while debuting his now iconic glass-smashing theme music in the process. Elsewhere, the main event would see The Undertaker and Mankind go at it again, this time in a Buried Alive match where the loser was to be literally buried six feet under. Yes, wrestling, as always, is weird, and despite putting on another valiant attempt to defeat his greatest rival yet, by the end of the match, it would be the dead man who was under the dirt, seemingly being killed off in the process as Mankind further established himself as the most feared figure in the industry and the only man who had the Phenom's number. But of course, that wouldn't be the end of The Undertaker. He'd be back the following month, in fact, using his supernatural powers to once again rise from the grave as, at November 17th's Survivor Series, he'd debut a new, darker incarnation of himself, finally getting the elusive victory over his rival with this. Before that happened, though, another new Intercontinental Champion would be crowned as, finally finding himself out of the doghouse, Hunter Hearst Helmsley would pin Mark Merrow on the October 21st episode of Raw to take home the secondary strap. And while he wouldn't defend that belt at Survivor Series, he would be part of one of four elimination matches that night, with his team of himself, Crush, Goldust, and Jerry Lawler ultimately falling to Jake Roberts, Mark Merrow, The Stalker, and another new debuting star, Rocky Maivia. That's right, this was the first WWF match for the man who would later go on to conquer Hollywood and, taking full advantage of the moment, he'd come out the sole survivor in the end, establishing himself as someone to watch out for going forward. Elsewhere on the show, meanwhile, a fake Diesel and Razor Ramon, two figures that had been brought into the company after Vince McMahon felt he could get away with recasting the roles, would be part of a team that, alongside Farouk and Vader, defeated Flash Funk, Jimmy Snuka, Savio Vega, and Yokozuna. Of course, the notoriously difficult-to-please New York crowd were having none of the budget click members, though, and let the company know how they felt about it by raining booze down on them. That said, this would change during the semi-main event as here, Bret Hart would finally return to WWF after almost legitimately jumping ship to WCW at one point in the summer when he was offered a big money contract himself. Staying loyal to McMahon though, he'd sign a 20-year contract with him instead, something which would ultimately cause the boss a major headache a year later. 
In kayfabe, however, the reason for his return would be nothing to do with money. No, it would come after weeks and weeks of being called out by Stone Cold Steve Austin, leading the hitman to finally decide it was time to teach him a lesson right in the middle of the ring in Madison Square Garden. But while Austin was certainly supposed to be the heel that night, it wouldn't have known it by the reaction of the crowd who, fully getting behind the rattlesnake by that point, cheered him like a conquering hero, something which even Vince McMahon was forced to take note of on commentary. And while Hart would end up getting the win come the end of the bout, after the bell rang it was clear that Austin was going to be a huge star going forward, although no one could have imagined at that time just how huge. Beyond this star-making performance though, the other main event of the night would see Shawn Michaels defend his WWF title against Psycho Sid in a match where, despite coming in the babyface, the crowd would quickly turn on HBK, evidently having tired of his antics by that point. And this would even lead to a hugely positive reaction for Sid when he came out as, for one brief shining moment, he looked like the superstar Vince McMahon always wanted him to be. So luckily then, the boss had already planned for this to be the night where, after some foul play at ringside involving the champ's manager Jose Lothario, Sid would be able to hit Michaels with the powerbomb and pin him in the middle of the ring to become the new WWF World Champion. Yes, it was a big moment, but it wasn't the only thing going on that weekend, as the next Hall of Fame class would also have been inducted the night prior, with this year's list of entrants including the likes of Captain Lou Albano, Superfly Jimmy Snuka, Killer Kowalski, Pat Patterson, and even Vince McMahon Sr. And as it happened, this would be the last Hall of Fame for almost a decade, with the whole thing not returning again until 2004, at which point it would become a regular annual occurrence all over again. Back in 96 though, while the crowning of a new world champion had shaken things up big time heading into December, the company couldn't take their foot off the gas just yet, as they'd be heading back out for another tour of the Middle East early that month. And while there, they'd hold another tournament to decide who was going to win the Middle East Cup, with this one eventually being picked up by none other than Bret Hart. So continuing on with the momentum he'd been building ever since his return then, the hitman would find himself in the number one contendership spot at the final pay-per-view of the year, In Your House 12, It's Time, on December 15th. And as the name suggests, this was originally going to be a show which saw Vader in a major spot, the main event in fact, as after his WWF title win had been scrapped at SummerSlam, Vince McMahon had originally started making plans to give him the belt at Survivor Series instead. Somewhere along the way though, plans changed with this and, well it's unclear exactly what happened, based on past incidents, it can certainly be imagined Shawn Michaels had something to do with it. Regardless of the reasons though, it would be Sid who main evented with Bret Hart, all while Vader would be left off of the card entirely. Elsewhere, meanwhile, Owen Hart and the British Bulldog would defeat the fake Razor Ramon and Diesel to retain their tag team titles, all despite an appearance from Stone Cold Steve Austin late on in the match, who, still holding a vendetta against the Hart family, continued to wage his one-man war on them, much to the increasing delight of the fanbase who now saw him more and more as the modern-day outlaw figure they could get behind. On top of that, Rocky Maivia would continue his rise with a quick victory over Salvatore Sincere. Mark Merrill would defeat Triple H to become the Intercontinental Champion once again, and The Undertaker would lay waste to Paul Bearer's newest client, The Executioner, basically territory legend Terry Gordy in a hood, in one of the most disappointing bouts of the night. That said, it was the main event people had paid to see, and that would deliver in many respects as the hitman and the champion went to war, all while Shawn Michaels sat at the commentary booth scouting out each man as he staked his claim to a future rematch with each. Yes, at this point, the plan was to redo Brett and Sean at WrestleMania 13 the following year. However, with real-life tensions between them continuing to grow, that would ultimately prove to be easier said than done once it was all over. Luckily then, Hart had another big rival at this time, one who would end up getting involved in this match too, acting like the reckless, uncontrollable madman people were quickly coming to fall in love with. Steve Austin would interfere towards the close of the bout, with this ultimately leading to HBK getting involved too, and accidentally costing Brett the match after the two had collided with each other on the ring apron. And after losing then, Brett would attack the former champion, taking out his frustrations on him and teasing the heel turn he would undergo in just a few months' time. That though is a story for another day, because this would mark the end of 1996, a year when WWF really began to transition away from the new generation era into something with far more attitude. 
And while things wouldn't fully blossom for a couple of years yet, the seeds that would see them enter their second boom period were already being sown here as, with the increasing beef between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, as well as the rise of Steve Austin, things were really beginning to heat up as we moved closer and closer towards the Attitude Era. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.